The Metal Mentality Podcast is brought to you in partnership with AM300 and the Phoenix Project. For more information on both, check out am300.com slash metal. It's time for you to be the you that you know you can be and to find your metal. My name is Preston Yule, and I'm the host of the Metal Mentality Podcast. I'm a husband, a father, and American soldier. What is metal? It's your strength of character that you rely on to endure hardship. It's your grit. Together we'll learn from some dedicated, passionate, metal-minded individuals who define themselves by their grit and their graduation from suffering. Be metal. Stay metal. You're listening to the Metal Mentality Podcast. Now, here's your host, Preston Ewell. Hey everyone, welcome to the show today. Today, I'm joined by an incredible guest. I'm so excited to introduce this person to you. He is a husband, a father, an entrepreneur, a personal development coach for adults with disabilities, and this is the best. He describes himself as the epitome of the survivor of God's gift of failure. David Salazar, how are you doing today? I'm awesome. I'm good. I'm good. Man, it, we've talked a little bit before we, we started, and I was like, no, stop. We... We need to save this because it's not. I want it to be genuine the first time. I, the first time I'm hearing all of this because I just sat there and I was like, I don't. This is incredible. Your your story is is so inspiring. Um, describing yourself as the epitome of the survivor of God's gift of failure is kind of what this show what we're trying to to do here is is use failure as a, a catalyst to to become better versions of ourselves. Um, at what point in your life did you? realize that you were the survivor of God's gift of failure. And I, I wouldn't even say survivor. I would say a thriver. I finally found one day, to be honest with you, I found one day all the teachings that my father taught me growing up and my mother, I finally slowed down enough to listen. That <laughs> God, God helped me. I just wasn't ready for it yet. And I finally realized that failure what was a gift from God. It wasn't the absence of God. It was the gift he provided us. And it was one of the many gifts that he provided us that we just, we look down on a lot. And once you learn to embrace them, oh man, you can go do whatever you need to. Life becomes that much easier and uh i think it's awesome i love it yeah hey failure is a requirement but before we get into that i want to go back to the most serious question i like to ask everybody the show Uh, what is your opinion on bigfoot my opinion on bigfoot real simple he's real (laughs) finally finally someone who thinks that everyone I, i talk he's like nope Nope. And I'm like, look, I'm not saying I've seen Bigfoot. I'm not saying I believe in it, but there's something out there. That's all I'm saying. I just want I just want that to be recognized and acknowledged for what it is that there's something out there people are seeing. We don't have all these crazy people. I'm not going to get into it. I'm going to wait until we But thank you for validating me. <laughs> so, well, we'll get one all that. It's just, let's get back to what we were really here to talk about. We're not here to talk about Bigfoot. We can do another episode on that and a whole separate we'll start on the podcast. We're going to do that. But anyway. <laughs> so, uh, I want to I want to talk about you, before right before we started recording here. You said, um, "Hey, just want to let you know I, I have a speech impediment, and this will be either a really long interview or a really short interview." And so, the fact that you're willing to sit down and talk with us and having that disability at this still at this point in your life and having the confidence to know uh, that that doesn't define you is really admirable. So let's go. Let's start at the very beginning. What was life for you growing up as a kid? I'll tell you, um, me growing up in the in the seventies and the eighties, my middle school and and high school years, it was hard. Um, I'll tell you, you know, my my father and mother, we spoke Spanish in my household. Um, we uh, my mother was from another country. They had me later in life. Um, they were probably forty years old when they had me. You know, growing up, st- 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 
stuttering is something that affects the moment. Everything you do in life, you need to talk. Mm -hmm. um, raising your hand in school that you're here. Um, there was a lot of classes I failed because I couldn't say here. Um, my father was sick and I was always afraid I couldn't call 911 and ask for help. Um, I grew up, I grew up, um, I loved basketball tremendously. I was good at it. But all my friends would ask me, why aren't you playing anymore? Because I couldn't, I was afraid to call the plays. I couldn't say wh wh one. Um, it got to a point where my stuttering was so bad. I would, I would, I drew this picture as a little boy. And I drew a picture of me with my mouth open. And, and a picture of my body inside the mouth. And there were bars. Like I was trapped inside. I couldn't be who I was. Which was really, really hard growing up. Um, I was trapped. I was in a world all by myself. And I'm a very outgoing person. So I felt like I was caged. I was imprisoned. And I used to say to God, I used to have this prayer. You let me laugh. You let me run. You even allow me to walk. And then you start all my problems when I try to talk. It was my prayer to him of more of a conversation because I was mad at him. Why'd you make me this way? Which was tough. In school, you got to say your name. I couldn't say my name. People would either laugh, laugh at me, look away from me, or move on and not wait for me. It was tough. Um, but the hard thing for me was none of the kids ever made, never teased me. That was hard for me. There was a lot of guilt there. Not one kid ever teased me about it, which isn't normal. That shouldn't have happened. The adults were the ones that would tease and laugh and joke. And very grateful to parents who were very loving. To my mother who taught me I could do anything in the world. And a father who told me that my my speech, my stuttering, was a gift. And that one day I was going to have to stop running from it. And one day I was going to have to learn how to embrace it. And I told that man, you're crazy. But that's, uh, I think, g growing up with old school parents, going to a private school here locally, and wanting to play sports, it controlled me. As I became a teenager, just like all teenagers, I liked girls a lot and I couldn't talk to them. So I finally learned a way to get, I thought I was smart. I learned how to lie to girls because see, I would say the things I could say. I guess if you try to get down to legally, yeah, it's lying, <laughs> but, um, I was just trying to say the things I could. I'd go out on a date. I was known as the Coke man at the U games because I'd go to get us um, some drinks, but she was standing there and I couldn't ask for a, a, a one Coke. So I'd go, I'll take 12 Cokes and a Sprite. And she'd look at me and I remember one girl goes, why are you ordering all these Cokes? All oh, they're for the kids, all the kids that are here. And I'd go hand them out. I was broke, <laughs> but <laughs> hey, it worked. So you worked. could say 12, but you couldn't say I couldn't say, yeah, yeah I couldn't. Uh, yeah, whatever I could say at the moment is what I'd say. Uh, being a person who stutters, you learn to survive. That's all it's about. Mm -hmm. 
It's not about living. It's about surviving. And that's what I did the majority of my young life. I survived. People ask me my name. Ted, Mike, Fred. I couldn't say my name. One day, I was at a party with some girls. And I didn't want to look dumb. So I started saying, you know, wait, what's your name, Tim? Oh, hey, nice to meet you. Another girl, Mike. At the end of the night, we're all together. And they so, hey, Mike, come here. And she's like, you dummy. It's, it's not Mike, it's Tim. And as they start to all argue about four names that my name was, I just snuck out the back door. Those might sound like sad stories. They're a reality for thousands of people who are like me. And, um, but they did mold me. They mold me into something. And, and they mold me into a guy who was full of, who was mad, who was angry with society, with God. And, and, um, to a point to where I didn't want to talk anymore, to where a few times I pretended that I was deaf and I would use sign language. That kind of fear every single day of your life, it's taxing. What, what were you fearing? I was fearing, let me give you words instead. Dumb, stupid, not able, less, smaller, not accepted. Uh, um, not getting out what you feel. Why me? What did I do wrong? That's what I felt. Did you feel that um, if someone, if you were to talk and someone would have those thoughts that it would validate those beliefs you had in your, of yourself? Did you believe those, that you were those things? I did. I had a label on my head that I was a person. It, it, it wasn't David. It was the boy who, the boy who st stutters. It was the man who stutters. It was the man who's disfluent. It was things that they weren't me. And my place of safety was around my mother and my father. And um, this is a person I don't talk a lot about of, but my brother, you probably heard the story of Moses. Moses, he had a, he had a knotted tongue. Just another word for a person like me. So because he stuttered, Aaron, his brother, used to speak for him. I had that too. That was my brother, Felix. And uh, the guy used to speak for me all the time as a little boy. Every, everywhere. He spoke to me. He spoke for me. And then I grew up with my father being my, my buddy who would always make sure that I felt good about myself. So in my home, I felt like a God. I walked out the door, I felt like nothing. And those are hard times. Um, I, 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 I will tell you, the day I left high school was the day I regretted wanting to even get older. Just because I had a I had a nice relationship with everybody there, everyone who I was. But before people could hurt me, I learned something really quick. Be tough and be mean, and no one will hurt you. So I started to be a jerk to people on purpose, because I figured, hey, maybe if you're scared of me, you won't hurt me. Preemptive measures. Yeah, you go again. Survival. I was surviving. I wasn't living. How long do you feel you survived for before that that mentality changed and you you thirty be, became who you who you became who you were? You you know what? It probably started when I was about twenty four years old. Is when I started the process, and it finally left me at thirty two years old. What started that process for you? 
you know, as I was, I went in, <laughs> it's kind of funny, I, I, for the first time, I met another person who talked like me. She was probably 85 years old. Sweet woman. She was the head of the National Stuttering Project. And I was sitting there listening to her story. And she goes, David, why don't you come with me? I have a little group of people. And these were all people who had the affliction like me, who stuttered. And I went to the first meeting and this huge, huge African-American man, well-dressed businessman starts talking. And I can't stop laughing. He, he actually stuttered just like me. And he was mad comes up to me right to where I was sitting. He goes, do you have a problem, young man? And, I, and he goes, why are you laughing? I go, <laughs> I go, first of all, I thought the Hulk was green. <laughs> he was this muscular, big man. And, and I go, second, I thought I was by myself all these years. It's cool to see someone like you have the same issue as me. I look at you and I thought you'd have the whole world in the palm of your hand. And that's where it started. Just started. I got to see other people like myself. But did I have the... the uh, did I have the, 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 the love for myself yet? No, not yet. Um, soon after, I met my wife, Jennifer. And every day that I'd go on, no one knew. Everyone knew I was fluent. I would do, I'd go at all costs to lie. And it sounds like a smart thing to do, but it wasn't. Um... It became a drug in a sense because it was a way to preserve myself. When I met my wife, we're, we're, on, we're, we're on a date and she says, out of the blue, we're sitting at a park, Conwood Heights, on a hill in the evening. I, could, I know like the back of my hand all these years ago. And she looks at me and she goes, oh, hey, hey, Dave, I just want to let you know you're... You're, you're just fluent to your stuttering thing. I, I'm fine with it. it. It doesn't bug me. What? What are you talking about? Well, your, your, your thing, you stutter. It's okay. I don't know what you're talking about. You're crazy. That's when things began to evolve. Um, soon after my dad passed and before he passed, he, uh, he had three goals. One is that I graduate college. Second was that I'd graduate college knowing how much that I don't know. And third, that I would one day embrace my gift and I never knew what he meant by that so the day he died he uh, he whispered his last words to me and it was um, never 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 forget me and he left a note as well. Come to find out, my dad growing up, <laughs> he spoke just like me. He just was lucky to grow out of it. And he had been trying to teach me all this time how special I was. And um, he left me, uh, he, he left me uh, a note that said, David, never forget where you came from. If you get, if you forget where you came from, you cannot learn, 
And if you cannot learn, you cannot teach. So never forget where you came from so others can learn. Um, that was the pivotal point of where I started to listen. Things started to come together. I started to embrace my speech. My, I started to notice that all the stories he shared with me, bling, 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 it was just, it was coming from everywhere. Well, I have one question, actually two questions for you. Why do you think he, he never told you he had that? And what did he mean by never forget me? He, 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 uh, he, he, he never shared that with me because it wasn't about him. His whole life was about his kids. And he did not want to take away from anything of who I was, from anything that he tried to teach me through stories. Because he felt that my speech was actually a gift. He saw it no other way. He thought it was a gift. So I'm not going to share with you my, my issues with stuttering growing up because this is a gift. I'm going to teach you the great things about it. And I'm going to teach you how to, how to handle life as it comes. He used to have this saying. And he would tell me in Spanish, he goes, son, I'm not going to, he goes, you're taught in this world, a storm's coming, batten down the hatches, batten down the hatches, there's a storm coming, go run and hide, hold on tight. He goes, mijito, which is just a term of, it's a Spanish term of endearment for us, my son. He goes, mijito, I'm going to teach you how to dance. It, it. I'm going to teach you how to dance in the rain. I'm going to teach you how to dance in the storm. I'm going to teach you to look at the beauty of the colors of the storm. I'm going to teach you how to be thankful for the storm. I'm going to teach you how to smell the beautiful things that are within that storm. I'm not going to teach you to bury your head in the sand. I'm not going to teach you to run and hide. And he goes, and you're going to find it once you embrace your gift. He kept talking about this gift. What's this gift? I looked everywhere for this gift. I tried everything. And then <laughs> I went and volunteered. And there was this little boy. He had cancer. And they had to remove his legs. And he was very, um, it meant a lot to me because when my dad passed away, they had to remove his legs too. So this little boy, oh my God, just not shy. He was about eight years old. He goes, what's wrong with you? I'm like, what? What's wrong with you? You talk pretty funny. I'm like, really? And he goes, yeah. And I'm like, I got this thing. I go, I talk this way. I, I, I go, you know what? I, I stutter. Sometimes I get stuck. Sometimes I don't. And he goes, hey, you know what? You and me can be partners. Because they're having a full day of outside events. He goes, you can be my legs. And I can speak for you. And I'm like, all right, let's do it. This kid and I, we became buddies. He passed away about six months after. But he, he would always say, I wish I could be like you. Why did he say that? Why do you feel he said that? Because he was pointing out a gift which I had, which is hard for me. Um, at that time, I personally get just, um, um, to be honest with you, sharing these stories don't get, I've never gotten real, real emotional about it because I used to talk about it all the time when I was younger. I don't talk about it no more. Come a long way since then. But it was the beginning 
of me looking within myself, of saying, there's something special about this. I went to God one day. I just literally dropped on my knees. And I go, I don't know why you did this to me. I don't know why, you, why you're doing this to me. But fine. Fine. I leave it to you. Leave me. Tell me. Tell me what you want me to do. I was swearing at him, yelling at him. And, uh, and, uh, <laughs> and the next day I woke up and I remember very clearly stories that my dad told me along the way. Um, that, you know, I had a choice at that moment to have God take away this affliction from me. And I didn't want him to. For the first time in my life, I was afraid he was going to take this from me. And I, I, I ended up reassessing all the gifts that it has brought me. And it was tough to, it, it was tough to, um, It, it 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 was a really tough transition between when I finally told God I'd leave it in your hands. All the stories that my dad taught me along the way became my programming. That almost like I wasn't ready for it yet. I was not ready for what was being taught to me until that moment he had to have passed for me to learn which crushed me i had to go through these things to become who i am and i finally saw the light this that told me that that stuttering wasn't my issue it was a person in the mirror that was my issue it was just one of the many issues that was holding me back. I jumped on and I started doing, I went, I went to the University of Utah and I asked, um, I had been, uh, I, I, I'd quit college. Um, I wanted to go back to school really bad. Um, I had a point nine five. Okay. There was no number Your in GPA front of that. Was a point nine it five. was a point nine five. Not a one point oh <laughs> or one point five, but it was a point nine five. And and a lot of my first year was because I couldn't say here. I I couldn't show I was present. Or you'd have to talk in class. I went and I begged the school to let me in. And they gave me a, a three, they, were, they gave me three quarters or two quarters at the time to, to get me to where I, or for me to show that I could be there. Talking about two semesters? Two semesters. So at the time it was quarters. Mm -hmm. And so it was two quarters. And, um, and then I went to the School of C Communication Disorders and I asked, um, I asked them, I go, can I, I'd like to be a speech therapist. Can I be a speech therapist? I, I, I stutter, but I, I, I kind of wanted your thoughts. And whoever I spoke to on the phone said, you know what? You might want to look into something else. And that made me angry. And I said, I'll show you. So I went to school and I went and I, and I, uh, graduated in the department of, of, uh, communication disorders I went to speech therapy for the first time and um, that is where I began I began learning a little bit more about who I was 
what I was afraid of, and actually combating the issue. Instead of stopping stuttering, I now learned to become comfortable while I stuttered. My whole life, I did everything to not stutter. Now, I was going to change my life and do everything to feel comfortable while I stuttered. Before, I used to be in the storm and go run and hide. This time, I want to be in the storm and I want to dance in the rain. So I would practice. I met a guy by the name of Tom Gerster, a good friend of mine, speech therapist. And he's the one who said, why don't we go practice real life? And that's what we did. Went and practiced real life. I actually would stutter in front of people on purpose. And I'd go, stut, 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 stut. But not close my eyes and hide from you. Or try not to stutter. I stuttered on purpose. How embarrassing that was for a lot of people who would go and watch me. They were embarrassed for me almost. Biggest gift I was ever given. Liberated me from the embarrassment of trying to stutter. I did not want that embarrassment in my life. How, how was that liberating for you? Like how Was it the fact that you were doing it on purpose? Or was it the fact that other people were uncomfortable? What, what, I, don't, I don't understand this. And I, I just, yeah. help me understand. My liberation from it was, it didn't, it didn't own me no more. You were in control. I was in full control. Mm -hmm. I stuttered like you wore a black jacket and even it didn't matter. You wanted to wear that black jacket. You were content with that black jacket. You, you have blonde hair. You have no issues with your blonde hair. I was now stuttering without conflict, without judgment of myself. I used to fight the world, but I finally learned that the fight was here. I brought the fight home. And this is where the battle began. And that battle I took on was me fighting the survivor, the, the, the guy who survives against the guy who wants to just live. And being able to stutter in front of people and be a little bit more brings me a lot of confidence. But through that, it clicked. I found my gift. My gift that God gave me was my speech, my stuttering. That was the vehicle for the process to get to the result. I had to get dragged through the dirt. I had to get my face <laughs> pushed in the mud. I had to have the adults knock me down. I had to. To get to the result. God teaches us through pain, through failure. They're all vehicles of the process. You know, one of the biggest gifts my father gave me and mother was they never sat there and preached to me how great life was. They preached to me how, how great a moment would be. You're going to have the big house, David. You're going to have the big cars. You're going to travel around the world. They never preached that. They preached to me how to dance in the storm. And that the way, these, you'll never control what comes at you, but you will control how you react to it. That's where they preach to me. And to me, that life that I've been provided, I've been given, I'm so thankful for because that gift of, of stuttering, the kid who would, um, who would sign language to talk, the one who would lie. I'm grateful. Or I wouldn't be where I am today. And where I am today is I'm living. 
and I'm sharing and I'm giving back and I know why God now put me through it. It wasn't for me to go get fame and fortune. It was for me to help other people. His big, he gives people these things to help other people. He doesn't, you know, in my perspective, I don't care if you believe in Buddha, Jesus, whatever, Mother Nature. We're not giving gifts for material goods. We're giving gifts to help other people, period. And I'll be honest with you. You know, I asked God, okay, you gave me this this thing of, of, uh, of stuttering. Everything's getting smooth. And then... Everything's great. Kids are doing great. And then boom. God hits me. He takes he takes my 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 sister and um leaves my little nephew without a mommy. You, 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 you know, it you you look at these milestone, these steps that you go through life and to see the anguish that you go through in life, like with my sister, when she passed away, she had, she suffered from a mel, mental illness. Um, you know, she took her life and, um, I call her my sister. She was my sister-in-law. But she tried to call me the night before. And I knew she was just going to cause drama. Her son was at our house. He was just a little boy. I didn't answer the phone. And she uh, took her life. You know... You feel like if you would answer that phone call, she might still be alive? Uh huh. You have guilt? You feel guilty about it? Oh, yeah. I had a lot of guilt in me for a long time. She left me a note. I still carry it. It's in my car. I carry it. And it's a hard thing when you watch a little boy. You know, I thought my stuttering was a big weight to carry. To watch a little seven-year-old boy be told his mommy's gone. I've never seen nothing like that in my life. Most horrific thing you've ever seen. Horrific. I can't even explain the, the behavior, the feeling that took place in that room. As I was there with them to support them as things was going on. I went back to the storm. And, and I'm grateful for the lessons of the storm. Because, you know, we live in the storm every day. And it's how we view it and judge it is how we're going to live or survive. Yeah, perception we choose to. Perception we choose that. to live in. And I know now death is a part of life. Without life, there's no death. And without death, there's no life. That everything I look back at, all the trials that God's given me personally, have been... Have been his way of teaching me, of preparing me. And, and, and there's so much to do with, 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 I call, he's given me tools to use. A lot of tools I don't even know how to use. 
you know you know a lot of people consider failure like i said failure of failing to pick up the phone failure of no knowing knowing i should have picked up the phone failure of not handling my survival better instead of lying to people be a man enough to just say what i have to say because that's more important to all these things were t were just tools i didn't know how to use yet i think one of the biggest lessons i've ever i've learned is god's gift of of failure um he gives tools we always see he gives us tools of success he gives us tools of of uh of of survival he gives us tools of of making money or working hard being fast being a great athlete great speaker he gives us the tool of failure which is the ultimate gift because you can't get any of that without this my father he used to share with me a story he used to say you know david you need to learn to embrace all your weaknesses because, see, people have a bad perception of weaknesses. They're bad, so get rid of them. I'm going to teach you to embrace yours. Because, see, those are just tools you haven't learned how to use yet. If I gave a baby this hammer, what do you think would happen with, to that baby? He's going to hurt himself with it. He's going to hurt someone else with it. Or he's going to break something with it. But what if I take the time to teach him how to use that hammer, David? He could protect himself with it, protect someone else with it, or maybe even build something with it that will be here way beyond his time. Failure is such an important piece. I have failed, and I have failed, and I have failed. And I'll continue to fail. But I think the most important piece is that I know that it's just a stage to get me to the result I'm looking for. And that if I keep embracing my weaknesses, they're just strengths that are waiting for me to learn how to use them. And I think it's one of the, just one of the greatest gifts that are there. So... Yeah, I was having a conversation this morning with my wife before we, I headed up to meet with you here to do this interview. And she said something to me. She said, um, it's going back to several conversations we've had. She said, um, <clears throat> how are you doing on embracing your weaknesses? How are you doing in accepting yourself for who you are? I said, I'm doing good. So, I, don't know, I think of the reason why I have such a strong emotional response. This is, this is like the fifth time I've started crying since you started talking. And um, it's because I resonate so much with, with your story. And um, I didn't struggle with um, a speech impediment, but I had my own struggles. And a lot of the words you said, uh, I remember verbatim saying them. I am. Um, And as I was, when I was a kid growing up, um, I never felt that I was accepted by others. Um, and I didn't know why. I just wanted to love everybody and be kind to them and help them in any way that I could. And I think a lot of times other kids saw that as weakness in me because I didn't know how to own who I was. I was not able to accept who I was because I didn't know who I was. I didn't know that I was different for a positive reason. I am different than other people. I am different in that I have empathy for everyone. I have a compassion. I have compassion for people when they struggle. I feel people's pain. When someone tells me things, and you're telling me this growing up, I, I feel it. 
I don't think I'm an empath or anything like that, but I, I can put myself in that position with other people and imagine what that would be like for me. And as I did that as a kid, um, having an emotional response like I am now was seen as weak. So I ran and I hid too. Because I didn't know that it was a gift. And when you don't own who you are and you don't know how to accept who you are, um, you will mold yourself into any situation you're in to fit in and be accepted. I was a people pleaser. When you don't belong to yourself, you don't belong to anything. And that left an emptiness and a hollowness inside of me and a pain that I didn't know how to handle. So at an early age, I learned to numb that. And that was um, developed into addiction to pornography and anything I could get my hands on, substance-wise, to not have to deal with emotional pain. And when it got to the point where I realized it was a problem and I couldn't stop my behavior, I fell into depression. And I hated so much who I was. Because who I saw myself was, was the addict. The person who can't control his inhibitions. Weak. I was my failures. Not just in that. Everything that I failed at, I took on as my identity. That's what made me who I was. And I hated it. I did not like that person. And I got into the counseling and therapy and addiction recovery programs and... I could do good for a little while, and then I always went back to it. And it was because I was not able to embrace my gift that I had been given. And I, um, I remember I hit a point where I, I had done everything that I felt within my power, everything I knew that I could be doing, and I was not seeing the results that I wanted. And I, too, had a similar prayer that you did. That, um, I was angry with God. And I hated it. The fact that he wouldn't take it from me. That he would not make me what I felt was whole. And what I didn't realize then was that I already was whole. I was just choosing to see things from a perspective where I was empty and broken. Or a Swiss cheese. I was going to be a vehicle to help other people. So after I had this prayer, where I was yelling at God and I was angry at Him, I knew that the, I had, that this, these experiences, this pain and this hardship and depression that I was feeling, this hopelessness, that other people were feeling this way and they did not know how to overcome it themselves. And had I not struggled as a child to fit in and know who I was and embrace who I was and to go through all those pains, very similar to the stuff you're talking about, I would not be in this position right now where I'm sitting down right here talking to you and sharing this story. This podcast is the manifest of everything I have learned in my life. It's the way that I can help other people believe in themselves and use their pain and suffering as a catalyst to become better than they are. I, to be the vehicle to deliver your message and the message of everyone else who's been a part of this. To help every other single person in pain. Because we all go through pain. We all feel hardship. Go through hardship. We all suffer at some point in our life. And if we don't go through that, there's nothing that will shape who we are. There's nothing for us to 
strengthen our um, our mentality to make us tougher. Suffering and hardship and pain of every kind offers or offers us lessons that we cannot learn otherwise. It's the only way you can learn is through through hardship. It's true. And so I don't. That's the. That's that's why I like resonate with this your story so much is because I I, I've been there in a different vehicle, right? Right, right. Yeah, but same, same. You know, when it comes to when it comes to finding, you know, I've always told my sons, want it hard. Don't want it fast. Fast goes away fast. Taking a long time, when it's time, you'll get it. And it'll last forever. And and it's so important to be able to be comfortable with the storms. It's so important to understand that, hey, you know what? My perspective, God's like a dad. And you know what? You can yell at him. He's just he's gonna be patient for you. He's gonna give you the time you need. But I think the real important part is not to judge ourselves so hard. Understand that these are, we're human. We will make mistakes. We will fail. But we also were given the gift of failure. And because of that, we will also succeed. You know, probably one of the words that drives me the most insane is people saying, is, is, People look at everyone as, like, for example, like some people say, that's incredible. That even happened. How did that even happen? Almost looking at human beings are incapable from doing the greatest things, from doing the worst things. We have the ability. <laughs> we have no, we have no, there is no spectrum that we cannot reach. What's neat is the people who actually just look at life with joy. It's not result. It's not oriented by a result. I'm, um, if I have an affliction with alcohol, I didn't drink. If I don't drink for 30 days, I'm going to be happy on day 31. Why wouldn't you have been happy that you attempted? Mm. Joy. Joy is a constant. Joy is something that, that you should feel no matter the result. To become indifferent. I became indifferent, stuttering, or being fluent. The goal was always, I'm going to be really happy if I'm fluent. Well, I found to be really happy just communicating my thought. I'm going to be happy if I make this sell. I'm going to be happy attempting to make that sell. All of these tools that we have relate to so many other things. For example, in real estate, I never thought I was going to feed myself with my mouth. How am I going to feed my family with my mouth? It was only a dream. Feed a family with my mouth? It doesn't even work half the time. Do you think you're going to sit and buy a house from me if I go up to you and say, Hi, I'm David? All I know is I'm good. And I can look at somebody in the eye and look at the gifts that I've been given and not be afraid to share them. May I be a drug addict, alcoholic, uh, you name it. I'm always going to, I'm never going to again be embarrassed to share the path that God gave me. It's almost a spit in God's face. That path got me to where I am today. So I'm not going to hide from it. In fact, I'm going to put light to it. You know, it's funny. My, I grew up learning that 
that a that a um, in Mexico it's very they have a lot of old old ways of thinking. Some of them are pretty neat to listen to. My mom used to tell me we used to sit at the river and there's a spirit in the river. And she goes, and it's funny, this lady had a sixth grade school education and she tells me, you know what, David? We're made of water. The majority of everything we're made of is of water. Yeah, that's true, we are. He goes, look at the river down there. I go, yeah. And he goes, you see that big rock that fell in it? I'm like, yeah. Something fell right in its way. I'm like, yeah. If that was a human, what do you think would happen when something falls in its way? Stop. Let's try to break it down. Let's go around it. Just try to, he goes, look at that river. What's that river doing? Is it paying mind to it? Keeps on going. And over all these years, I look how the shape of the rock is. Because of its direction, all it sees is where it wants to go. It has shaped that organically. Without trying to break it down, move it out of the way, it has let itself just keep moving forward. Everything we do in life has to be about moving forward. No matter what rock falls in our river, what tree falls in our river, if we keep moving forward, those will dissolve, they will erode, and they will never slow down your, your, your spirit, the spirit of the river. And, you know, I look at those things and those are huge. And you truly, you know, me specifically, I'm, uh, again, sharing that you've been provided a, a chance, an opportunity to teach people about, well, I'll, I'll share my, I'll sh is that in a way, you've been to hell, buddy. Your own hell, right? Your own hell of just trying to survive. And you know how to get out. Question is, is are you willing to crawl back in to go help other people come out? That's the scary part. And that's the question you have to ask yourself. Because the day that you do that, the moment that you do that, is the day nothing owns you no more. That's the day that you'll be ready. That's the day you'll know. Are you willing to go back down and get the people who need help? And I, and I use that just as a, as a symbolic word because it feels like hell. But you're willing to go back in there to bring out people. Because you know the way out, brother. You know the way out. And one day, when we're old, and we're laying in a bed, not able to move, we will never judge ourselves for the things we did wrong. Ever. The only thing we're ever going to care about are the things we never did. It's the only thing. I asked my mom, 90 years old, what are the things that bug you? She goes, nothing. I'm at peace. I just wish I would have done this or I wish I would have done that. That's the only things that haunt me. And she goes, don't let that happen to you. Brother, you've been given something that most people don't get out of. You do have a responsibility to yourself to start living again. And you won't be fully living until you feel 100% um, 
in love with yourself, with that person in the mirror, the way you are, the way through the road you traveled, because they don't define you. None of that. And you know that. Mm -hmm. But like I said, I'll tell you, you've been given one of the greatest gifts. You found the way out. Yeah. And you being a soldier, I know you guys aren't scared to go back in. No, as you're saying that, like, I feel that uh, starting this podcast um, was the beginning of me going back in. I agree. Because I had to overcome so many insecurities. Right. That I, I didn't even, I knew they were there, but I had never put a, identified them. And the, starting this uh, forced me to address things uh, that I, I have been avoiding my whole life. I mean, even with having sobriety, um, that the sobriety piece was the beginning of learning to embrace myself for who I am. And now, they just hearing my voice being played back uh, before. I started this podcast, um, made me feel insecure. And now, um, I listen to all of every episode. I don't, I don't listen to the episodes before we publish them. Right. Uh, that's how much trust I have in, in Ammon and his production ability. And uh, I listen to them on Apple podcasts and I listen to them and I'll, and then I'll give them feedback. I'm like, oh, Hey, maybe we should do this next time. <laughs> maybe we should, uh, maybe I said, I need to say this, not that, whatever, whatever changes I need to make. Um, and that's something that I never would have done. Um, putting myself out there for who I am, not the picture that I'm trying to paint, how I want people to perceive me, is um, that took a lot of balls for me to do. I did. I mean, I'm 35. I was almost 35 years old when I, we started this. The first episode came out on my 35th birthday. It's taken me 35 years to get to this point. And as you're saying that, like, are you willing to go back into hell to get others out? That's what this podcast is, is me getting back into hell. I'm showing people how I got to where I'm at. Right. That your addiction does not define you. Got it. Your failure does not define you. Got it. What defines you is the way that you reacted to it. Right. What you decided to do with that. There you go. Is that pain has value. Right. And you have to recognize the fact that it has value. You if it. you don't see the value in that, you'll be miserable your entire life. You got it. And when you die, you will look back on it and say, man, I blew up a whole bunch of opportunities. I regret a lot. Then, yeah, everybody has regrets. You got it. Yeah. But everybody. right now, I, I can sit here and I can tell you, my only regret is I didn't start sooner. Well, there's one thing you can't do. You can't do that. Because that, take, that takes up gray matter. You need it for the future. Mm -hmm. Every time you go back and think that way, just think of it this way. That's gray matter you're taking up to help another person. That's mm -hmm. another gray matter for you to evolve to be able to help another person. That's why we're here. You, when when you're ready and you go to do it, I'll tell and, you right now, I'm ready right now, and this is me doing it right now. I'll tell you. We're not editing this. We're right, not right. Editing. We're uh, going to do it. Because, because if I say I'm when I'm ready, I'll never be ready. When I say the day that I'm ready, that day will never come. Because I'll, I'll tell you this. Your family, they love you. They love you for who you are, mm -hmm. man. There is no changing that. And, and you know what? Right or wrong. Right or wrong. Right or wrong, people are going to love you because they know who you are. All right, so we've been at this for a little while now, and uh, we're going to wrap this segment up, and we're going to do another episode with this. We're going to continue recording, and we're going to wrap up this segment here. What is, David, what is your takeaway um, from what we've talked about so far that you would like the people who are listening to this to, if you could summarize what, everything you said, the one takeaway for them uh, here? It all comes down to, it doesn't matter what life's brought you. Embrace your weaknesses, and there you're going to find your strengths. So if you're looking around trying to find strengths, look at your weaknesses. 
Don't throw them away no more. Don't put them in the garbage no more. Instead, embrace them. And also, if you are a, a spiritual person, when you're praying, say thank you. Say thank you for the opportunity to learn. Thank you for the failures. Start to redefine what failure means. Have joy every time you think of failure. And, and it's going to evolve you into living and no longer surviving. So just remember that. Surviving means... Su surviving is hiding. And to take away, I hope you guys, um, when the storms come, you no longer batten, out that, batten down the hatches. I hope that you guys learn how to dance in the rain. Because then, you're living. Thanks, David. In the next episode... So we're going to continue the interview here with David, and we're going to talk about how to dance in the rain and how to thrive when the storm is upon you. Hey guys, be sure to follow the Metal Mentality Podcast on social media. And as always, if you find value in the show, please leave a review and rate us five stars on Apple Podcasts. But more importantly, share this podcast with someone you know who would benefit from the messages from the guests on each episode. You can find us on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter at Metal Mentality.